Bird Note presents. From Bird Note, this is Bring Birds Back. I'm Tanaja Hamilton. Today, we are continuing our look at birds and cats. We're joined again by Mark Bramhill, producer for Bring Birds Back. Hey, Tanaja, great to be here. Great to have you back. I mean, you're almost always here anyway, but it is a fun time to have you up front. I already learned so much from you last episode. Let's see what you remember. Kind of talk it back to me. All right. So I remember that the number of birds that are killed by cats in North America each year is a truly astronomical number. I want to say somewhere between like one to four billion birds. Yep, that is exactly it. 1.3 to 4 billion birds killed by cats in North America every year. Oh, that is many a bird. Many a bird. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so we also talked about how keeping cats indoors can make a huge difference in helping birds, especially when birds are especially vulnerable. So thinking about dawn and dust, thinking about little fledglings are out in spring, and we can have an impact if we just keep our little cat friends indoors. Exactly. Fledglings are friends, not food. (laughs) When the Bring Birds Back merch comes out. (laughs) I gotta get that on a tote bag, yeah. (laughs) And then we talked about how to give your cat a great life indoors so that everyone really wins. And that included talking about all the exercise that you can do with your cat, setting up kind of like bird purview pay-per-view for birds with the cats sit at the window. (laughs) Yep, yep, some good cat TV, yeah. (laughs) There we go. Same concept, same concept. And then the last bit was that uh, the best cats representation that we have in this day and age was uh, Dame Judi Dench is Old Deuteronomy in 2019 Spectacular Smash Cats, and that single-handedly saved the birds. You know, I don't think that one was in there. (laughs) And uh, if you haven't listened to our last episode, maybe maybe do that first. <laughs> but yeah, we can't really talk about this issue about cats and birds without addressing a pretty large group, which is feral and stray cats, colonies of cats without homes. In some cities and places, they're more obvious, but there are an estimated 30 to 80 million of them in the U.S. It's a lot of cats. That is a lot of cats. And, you know, it really makes sense when you think about it because feral cats, they don't have an owner to maybe keep them inside. They can hunt anytime Mm -hmm. and (laughs) they need to hunt birds and other animals to eat. So, yeah, I can imagine they are a pretty big contributor to this problem. They actually make up the majority of those bird deaths. But while the pet cat issue can get heated... The feral cats are where things get wild. Most cat and bird people aren't willing to have a real conversation about it. But not everyone is like that. Uh, I I do have a pet cat. My pet cat is named Badger and is uh, sitting about 10 feet from me. This is Bob Salinger. I'm the conservation director for the Portland Audubon Society, and I've worked for Audubon for about 30 years. I'm going to assume that he is more of a bird guy. (laughs) He is, but he also loves cats. And he has been interested in this issue since the early 90s when he first joined Audubon. He was working in the Wildlife Care Center where they tried to help injured birds recover. And about 40% of their intakes were cat-related. And he would talk to the people bringing in these birds about keeping their cats indoors. But it just wasn't connecting with people. And I found that very interesting because the people that were coming to us clearly cared about animals, cared about birds, uh, were willing to drive a half an hour to bring us a bird that their cat had caught, but yet weren't willing to take the next step. That is really interesting. It's evident that they cared, but there's still something missing. Yeah, and as Bob saw more and more of these birds injured by cats he started to question the approach they had and looked into kind of the history of how they had approached the issue. I could go back into our archives and see writings by our founder, William Finley, talking about the problems of cats and cat predation dating back to the early 1900s. 
Lethal control and telling people to keep their cats indoors have been the dominant strategies for a century. Uh, yet today we have more free roaming cats in the United States than any time in our history. I was frustrated with the degree to which I felt we were singularly ineffective on this issue. So I was looking for a different strategy. Okay, so what strategies are there for dealing with feral cats? What are the options that Bob has here? Yeah, so as Bob just mentioned, the standard approach for bird organizations has been kind of scolding people to keep their pet cats inside and pushing for euthanizing lots of feral cats. They are not super popular options. Can we adopt these cats, these feral cats? Can we just bring them indoors? It's definitely the first thing to try, but adopting all of them out isn't possible. When these feral cats grow up, they're usually set in their ways and not suitable for life with people. They're essentially wild cats at that point. All right. We can adopt out the little baby kittens mm-hmm. and the friendly and approachable adults. Mm-hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's still a lot of cats that we're leaving out of the equation. <laughs> still a lot of cats that are out yeah. there. Yep. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> There are some other approaches. One is these programs adopting feral cats out as, quote, working cats to live on farms or in warehouses to hunt. There are questions about how good they are at killing the actual pests rather than wildlife. But even in the best cases, they're still usually outside and able to kill birds. So what does that leave us with? Well, That brings us to a really controversial approach that many cat people have rallied behind. It's called TNR, or Trap, Neuter, Return. I spoke to Karen Krauss, executive director of the Feral Cat Coalition of Oregon, about this. We provide humane live traps, and the people will trap feral cats, bring them to us for spay, neuter, and vaccinations, and then they'll return them to where they're being fed. Thus, Trap, Neuter, Return. It's a compelling idea. If the cats can't reproduce, the feral colonies will slowly shrink and disappear. That's what drew Karen to TNR in the 90s. I had volunteered at an animal shelter in the Midwest where feral cats were euthanized. That seemed, you know, in the early 90s as, I guess, what just happened to feral cats. And I moved to Oregon, and I saw this group, and I thought, oh my gosh, there's an alternative. There's, there's help for them. So this feels like everyone wins, but if it's controversial, I'm guessing there is more to it. <laughs> there is definitely more to it. You know, these cats are still out in the environment for the rest of their lives, killing birds and wildlife. And it's very hard to make the math work. Studies have shown that you need around 75 to 90 percent of the feral cats in a colony to be sterilized to actually see the population decrease. And that is really hard to achieve. And you remember Dr. Pete Mara from last episode? Yeah, I do. He had a tuchus. Tuchus was his cat. (laughs) Um, Yep. And he did research, and he's the one who found those really huge numbers. Exactly. Well... This is an issue that Mara is pretty passionate about. He and many bird people really only see one way forward, and that is euthanizing millions of these cats. Humane euthanasia is an unfortunate outcome, but the harsh reality of the situation is I don't want those cats killing an oven bird. I don't want those cats killing a Townsend or a Toey. Um, And that's what they'll do. And so it's not an easy solution to come to, but I don't really see another solution. Do you? But Pete, what about Tuckus? <laughs> what about Tuckus, Pete? <laughs> He's saying that to save one species, we have to kind of cull another. I don't know. I can see why people might be uncomfortable with that. Yeah. And so we have cat advocates pushing for TNR or bust, that this is going to be the solution that saves us. And bird advocates like Peter Mara, who are unwilling to even talk about it, really. And it's just a lot of real anger and mistrust from both sides. And we get stuck in these echo chambers. But this is where we come back to Bob and Portland Audubon. It's the 90s. He's out looking for a way to actually get through to people. 
and he hears about Karen Krauss and this new organization, the Feral Cat Coalition of Oregon. I first really heard about them because the media started calling me up and saying, you know, say something bad about them. You know, there was this uh, expectation that the cat advocates and the bird advocates would be at each other's throats. I didn't take the bait. Instead, I went to their website. I looked at their mission and I was struck by how similar the language was. They want people to keep their cats indoors to reduce free roaming cats in the environment because that was one of the primary sources of feral cats and th- the population problem they were trying to deal with. So I reached out, I asked for a meeting and I said, you know, I'd love to get together and uh, see if we have any common ground. And um, I was pleased that Karen reached back. It was barely even a discussion. You're protecting the environment. We're trying to help the cats, but we clearly have an overlap. So yeah, of course, we were more than happy to sign up for that. And that was really the start of it. The two organizations partnered up beginning by signing a joint letter in support of keeping cats indoors. I mean, everybody has to start somewhere, but is a joint letter really that big of a deal? Does it change anything at all? Well, I mean, you're right. It's absolutely more symbolic. But the fact that these organizations were collaborating on anything was really unusual. And their partnership has deepened over time. They've worked together on policies and approaches to decrease feral populations. And that has included the bird world heresy of embracing TNR. I think the conservation community has made an error here in the sense that it's treated TNR as an existential threat rather than as a tool in the toolbox. If you spend all your time bickering over this one tool in the toolbox, it's very hard to make progress on the overall issue. Wow, that does seem like a leap of faith for the bird people. It really is. And the significance of that openness isn't lost on Karen. When you want a partner and you ask the conservation groups to accept trap, neuter, return, they're giving, right? They're out on a limb, giving, believing. And so I think animal welfare groups need to give a little too. One example of compromise from the Feral Cat Coalition is... Once feral cats are sterilized, they aren't returned to important wildlife areas in order to reduce pressure on bird hotspots. By partnering with the Feral Cat Coalition, Portland Audubon has a seat at the table. The organizations have worked together and looked for ways their missions overlap. And one part of that has been working together on this big TNR project. And after the break, We're going to go to an island of feral cats to understand how that has been working. Mark Bramhill, you got to spend time at the cat island? (laughs) Yep. That's after this. Are you looking to begin bird watching? Find new ways to appreciate nature? Just looking to push your birding skills to the next level? You can find courses on all of these subjects and more at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Bird Academy. Bird Academy's self-paced online courses continue a century-old Cornell Lab tradition of sharing the wonder and joy of birds with people from all walks of life. Whether you're just starting to discover the joys of bird watching, a budding ornithologist, an expert looking to fill out your life list, or you're interested in skills like nature journaling or bird photography, Bird Academy has something for everyone. To find out more, click the link to Bird Academy in the show notes. Or find them at academy.allaboutbirds.org. That's academy.allaboutbirds.org. Okay. So the Feral Cat Coalition and Portland Audubon have been working together to find common ground solutions to protect birds and feral cats. And you said part of that takes place on an island of feral cats. Um, Please say more. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So that brings us to the Hayden Island Project. All right. Um, Thank you guys all for coming today. Hayden Island is located just north of Portland in the Columbia River. It's pretty small, about a total of 1.7 square miles. Just about 2,000 people live there, but they're not alone. There are also about four to 500 feral cats that also (gasps) call Hayden Island home. 
It's like a cat playground. <laughs> yeah, it's an island of cats. Joe Liebezite, a staff scientist at Portland Audubon, leads a research project on these cats. And last fall, I was able to tag along for their annual cat count of the island. A key part of the project is having you guys, community scientists, go out into the field and count the cats. Unlike a lot of bird projects where you have to identify all kinds of different birds, it's pretty easy to identify a cat, right? We love a good community science project. (laughs) For sure. So three times each September, Joe and a bunch of volunteers get together to tally up the island's cat population. And what are they trying to understand from this study? Yeah, they want to know basically how the population control strategies are or are not working. Studying and tracking TNR has been kind of difficult to do in the past. A big part of that is because most of the time, the cat groups that are doing TNR don't trust the bird researchers not to come in and vilify cats. It's really something which is only possible because of the trust that these organizations have together. When I went with Joe for this uh, community science project, you know, the volunteers include cat fanatics and avid birders uh, and people everywhere in between. And everyone is really excited to be part of this. They're all excited to work together. We broke into different groups to kind of survey different parts of the island. I tagged along with Joe, his daughter Petra, and her friend Griffin. We went through this manufactured home community. And pretty much right away, one. we saw some cats. <laughs> Where? Right there. Right. Uh, no, you're there. How cool is it to have this project where all these different people, all these different ages? I mean, I hear this little girl going, no ear tip. Mark, what's an ear tip? What does that even mean? So when they're spayed or neutered, many of these organizations will cut off like a tiny bit of the ear tip so that it's got a noticeable marker that this cat's already been brought in. If we catch it again, we can just release it and call it a day. (laughs) Got it. They also note the color of the cat, if it has a collar, uh, if it's visibly pregnant, and if they know that it's a pet cat. So look, now he's approaching. Definitely a social one. Sometimes the pets are pretty obvious. You could probably tell from that guy's little meow. <laughs> he was he was just coming right up like, all right, I'm ready for some pets. I'm here. <laughs> just a little bit of a strut. <laughs> so I went further up here. Uh, yeah, it was just crossing the street. Okay. White, black and white. It looks like he's an older cat because his ear is a little uh, ripped up, which makes it tricky to tell if it's got a tipped ear. Uh. <laughs> Does that one have a collar? No collar. Okay. It was just so, (laughs) so many cats. So many cats. Hey, look, guys, up in the sky, there's uh, two sandhill cranes flying above us. Two sandhill cranes. Hey, I can switch to birding, okay? It's okay. (laughs) I can do, I can count cats and I can look up in the sky and see cranes. I love that. It seems like the kids are like, look, sir, one one track mind, please. We are here for the cats. <laughs> and and Joe kind of has a has a problem staying away from the birding. Yep. We're all here for the cats, but Joe's a bird guy at heart. <laughs> That's a great sighting, guys. That's a like sandhill cranes. You don't see them every day. As we walk around this neighborhood between cat sightings, I ask Joe about their study results. They've been doing TNR on this island for about seven years. And the population has stayed relatively stable, though it's trending slightly downwards. The group estimates that half the feral cats here have been sterilized, and that percentage is rising. But that is very far from the 75 to 90 percent found to be effective in other studies. Yeah, not quite there yet, huh? Not quite. Not quite there. (laughs) As we approach the end of our route, Joe tallies up the cats we've seen. Let's see. We got one, two, three, four, five, six. We've walked about a half seven, mile eight, nine, down seven, three eight, streets in this 12, neighborhood. 13, 14, 15, That's a lot 15, of cats. 15, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23. In three streets, 23 cats. And we we know that we're, we won't see every cat, obviously. So yeah, that's a... That is a very large number for that little ground covered. <laughs> it really is. And... Many of the cats we saw hadn't been sterilized. Clearly, TNR alone is not going to magically solve everything. But that also doesn't mean that this has necessarily been a failure. Hmm. How's that? Well, 
by embracing TNR, Portland Audubon has been able to work together with the Feral Cat Coalition. And that has led to concrete steps to actually move the needle. The Feral Cat Coalition offers spay and neuter services to anyone for a suggested donation, but it's free for those who need it. They treat around 7,000 cats a year and recently fixed their 110,000th cat. They do research projects like this one on Hayden Island. And while euthanasia isn't a huge part of their efforts, both organizations are committed to keeping it available when needed. Are other people skeptical of this partnership? Oh, absolutely. They have heard from plenty of naysayers. Uh, I thought they might. On both sides of this issue, uh, outside groups were very, very concerned that if the Feral Cat Coalition worked with Portland Audubon, that it would be a slippery slope toward rounding up cats and killing them on a large scale in Portland. And conversely, I think a lot of bird groups felt that if we work with the Feral Cat Coalition, Portland would become uh, the epicenter of protected free-roaming cats. But that hasn't happened. It's not just the folks at Portland Audubon that are giving a little bit. The Feral Cat Coalition is just as protective of that approach as Audubon. Yeah, it's a kind of just charming and two sides coming together for the greater good. Yeah, it is pretty heartening. Here's the thing. That's about as good as things get in the world of birds and feral cats. A good faith effort with cat people and bird people trying to solve it, that's a success story. It's important to talk about this side of the cat's problem for people to know about it and understand the complications of it. But I want to end our two-parter on a high note. Something positive and really promising for our listeners. And Portland Audubon and the Feral Cat Coalition have a project that perfectly fits the bill. They've taken the platform they have with cat lovers and used it to actually convince some of them to keep their pet cats inside. They're making real headway on the pet side of the problem, where we actually have a real good answer. Well, what are they doing that's different from what Audubon has done in the past? Like, why is this resonating when what Bob saw in the past didn't click? It all has to do with fun. In the 90s, uh, enclosed outdoor spaces for cats, known as catios, like a, a cat patio, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I see, I see what they did there. They were an emerging trend in Portland because, well... Portland. Uh, (laughs) uh, And Karen came to Bob with this idea of doing the Portland Catio Tour. And she said, um, Portland's really famous for its tours. Be it a chicken coop or environmentally designed homes, there's all sorts of tours and people really enjoy them. So why not a Catio Tour? And I said, you know, that sounds like fun. Uh, I didn't think it would be hugely successful, but I thought it would be a, a cool thing to do and let's give it a try. We weren't sure what the result would be, but it seemed like a great way to show people an alternative. I feel like there was a little bit a difference in confidence level around that, but... uh... (laughs) Yeah, for good reason. For very good reason. That first tour, we were hoping to get a couple hundred people. We had to cut off registration at 600 two weeks before the event. Today, uh, seven, eight years later, we're getting 13, 1,400 people coming out for it and having to cut off registration a couple weeks before the event. I'm getting people calling me up the day of the event, begging for tickets. You know, people call up like they're Rolling Stones tickets and saying, uh, you know, I don't know you, but a friend of mine gave me your phone number and they said you might have an inside line. Uh, It's huge. Well, that seems like a time. Yeah. And on this tour, you get to see some of the Portland area's more than 600 catios, um, which just seems like such a blast, you know? (laughs) 600 catios. Yeah. And they really run the gamut. All kinds of unique catios from, you know, the $150 do-it-yourself job to these incredibly elaborate catios that are nice to do in my house. And I think that's one of the takeaways for folks is it doesn't have to be elaborate. Okay, well, this sounds like a blast. It sounds so fun. But besides that fun part, what impact does a tour like this actually have? Yeah, it's something where it seems like it might just be this this silly thing, but it's actually really made an impact on people keeping their cats inside. 
what we're seeing is that we are getting the change that we were seeking. People go on the tour and they go home and they build a catio. And then a year or two later, they want to be on the tour. Here's this really fun thing that somebody's doing that, you know, by the way, it protects their cat, it protects the birds, it's good for the environment. And, you know, look how cool this thing is. People having catios, it's just becoming normalized. So, you know, something that kind of sticks out to me is as I have been getting a little deeper into this world where we talk about cats and our big numbers and conservation and generally science communication, how we talk about these things to people, um, something that's very clear to me is that you can't be a jerk about it and then expect (laughs) people to want to do good things. And this is... You know, something I've heard time and time again from my very good friend, Ray Matufi. She has a PhD in scientific misinformation. And she always says that to reach people, kind of reach across the aisle and say like, hey, maybe you should consider this thing that you normally wouldn't consider. It takes a lot of empathy. You're not going to convince people to keep their cats indoors by making them feel like terrible people and like a bad cat owner. Yeah. These cat owners really love their pets. They want to do the best. And this way feels so obvious once you hear it. But by making having an indoor cat fun and quirky and appealing with like a catio or taking them for a walk or doing these things, like suddenly it's this enticing, exciting to talk about thing where you're luring people in with something they want to do. They're a little quirky, but that's the point, right? Like, it's <laughs> the quirkiness isn't a byproduct. Yeah. It's, it's more of like, yes, it needs to be these quirky, really cool new ways to show how we can make this exciting for all. And if we keep some of our pet cats indoors, if we spay and neuter others, and if we improve support for low-income pet owners, we can make a massive impact here. Absolutely. Like, it would be great if we could go from four billion to zero overnight. But if we can make real progress on the pet cat front, we don't have to solve everything at once. And kind of what I've found is that when we're both fighting, both cats and birds lose. Like, no one, mm. no one is winning when we come at each other with such animosity. It's just... Nobody's thriving here. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's something where, you know, when I've gotten to see these cats living it up on their catios <laughs> or taking Pigeon out on a walk, it's a reminder that what's right for birds and what's right for cats is possible. And it is totally worth it. Thanks for coming on to share all of this and your love of cats that could not possibly be contained in just two mere episodes. But we felt it. We feel it. (laughs) Thank you for having me on, Tanaja. I had an absolute blast. Bring Birds Back is produced by Mark Bramhill and me, Tanaja Hamilton. Today's episode was edited by Oluwakemi Aladesuyi of Rough Cut Collective and by Ashley Ahern. Our content director is Allison Wilson. Our lead science advisor is Trina Bayard. Music is by Cosmo Sheldrake and Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Connor Guerin and Rika Murthy. And thanks to our seasoned sponsor, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Check out all they have to offer, like Bird Academy online courses and the Merlin ID app at allaboutbirds.org. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Catios and some people taking their cats for walks or on adventures, like, There's a reason they go viral on Instagram and TikTok. Like, they're exciting. They're fun to look at and think, like, well, what if I did that with my pet? Like, that would be a fun thing that I could do with Pigeon or someone could do with their little fluffy buddy. (laughs) Absolutely. Like, I'm not not just a cat mom. I'm a cool cat mom, you know? (laughs) Amy Poehler's just hanging out with her with her cat on a leash, you know. <laughs> I know. I want my pink velour sweatsuit. I want it. And my camcorder. <laughs> <laughs>